Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Kate Ertman. I'm the president of the Rotary Club of Portland. Welcome to our online video weekly membership meeting. So this week, I'm wondering, have you heard that Rotary International will be hosting a telethon? Yep, it will begin at 10 a.m. this Saturday, May 2nd, and it will be a Facebook Live event. It will be simulcast in eight languages with the goal of raising $1 million. Now, nearly 4 million in Rotary disaster response grants have already been put into action on the front lines to battle COVID-19. An additional 6.9 million in Rotary Foundation global grants have also been approved. I hope you'll be able to join this live event on Saturday, this Saturday, to hear stories of hope, inspiration, and gratitude from Rotarians, Rotaractors, and friends of Rotary from across the globe. Now, if you're not a regular user of Facebook, I suggest Googling Rotary International Telethon, and that should show you the exact link to click on to be able to watch it. The telethon will also showcase one of the things that I had mentioned a few weeks ago, which is how Rotary's polio eradication infrastructure is now helping to combat COVID-19. With that, please welcome Rotarian Phil Levinson to give this week's reflection. The picture that's on the screen could be contemporary and you, the only clue that you have is the clothing that people are wearing. This picture is 101 years old, but the poem I want to share with you was written two months ago by Katie O'Meara. And the people stayed home and read books and listened and rested and exercised and made art and played games and learned new ways of being and were still and listened more deeply. Some meditated, some prayed, some danced, some met their shadows. And the people began to think differently and the people healed. And in the absence of people living in ignorant, dangerous, mindless and heartless ways, the earth began to heal. And when the danger passed and the people joined together again, they grieved their losses, and made new choices and dreamed new images and created new ways to live and heal the earth fully as they had been healed. Thank you. Thank you, Phil, it's perfect. And that photo really couldn't be more appropriate. Thank you so much for doing that today. If anybody out there would like to be a participant in one of, in one of our videoed weekly meetings, please don't hesitate to reach out to Siobhan or Corinne in the office and let us know if you would like to give one of these week's reflections. I would also like to welcome any virtual guests. Thank you for tuning into our weekly membership meeting. And as always, I would like to extend a happy anniversary to everyone who became a Rotarian in the month of April. You can see the membership April anniversary list in the email that was sent along the video leak or right now, right here um, on this screen, as well as on our website. Just go to click on membership and you will find the anniversary list there. It's a great way to consider who it is that you're going to reach out to this week, who you're going to extend that fellowship to this week in our club. And thank, thank, whoever you, um, thank whoever you are reaching out to who has an anniversary this month. Thank them for their years of service above self. Next up, Preserve Planet Earth is the committee that we highlight in the month of April. So please welcome from the Preserve Planet Earth Committee, Rotarian and past president, Scott Burns. Well, welcome to all of you. Uh, and I just want to take a, a few seconds to mention two different things. What does the Preserve Planet Earth uh, Committee do? Uh, and I've been on the committee for 22 years. The only person who's been on it longer, what you saw last week, and that was Don Livingstone. We, were, we started in 1993, I think. And this was a global thing in Rotary uh, to highlight environmental problems. And that's what our committee actually does. Last week, you saw our annual thing that we do, and that is the Environmental Achievement Award that we have been doing uh, for over 25 years. Uh, and um, it, I was excited about the talk by Green Hammer. I wish I didn't have a nice house that if I was going to have a house built, I would have them do that. A zero energy house, wow, he did a wonderful job. And then uh, 
the award going to the Eco School initiative that is out there. Uh, wow, I can't wait until next year when uh, they talk there. So the winner of the award gives a talk the, the following year, and it's always the Tuesday right before Earth Day. Um, other things that the Preserve Planet Earth Committee does, uh, we have field trips, for instance. Um, and we have done field trips up the gorge, up to Mount St. Helens, to the coast, to learn about the uh, magnificent environment that we have in the Pacific Northwest. Every year we do a red, white, and green wine tasting tour and highlight the environmentally conscious wineries that we do. Hopefully we will have one of those coming up this year. Uh, we also had a great uh, hike. The four, uh, in Portland, you've heard the four, four T's. Uh, trail, train, tram, and trolley. Well, we had the five T's because we also went to a pub at the end and did a toast. Uh, and, and we probably may do that again this coming year. Um, we meet once a month. There are 11 of us on the team. Liz Zaborski and Ryan Wood are the co-chairs, but Liz is gonna be having a baby, so she's gonna be taking a maternity leave, and so we're looking for a second chair there. So if you're interested in becoming part of our committee, please join us. The other thing I wanted to mention was Wednesday was the 50th anniversary of Earth Day. And it was very significant, not only for the world and the earth, but then also for me. Uh, I went to Stanford, did my bachelor and master's degree. Uh, a good friend of mine at Stanford was a guy named Dennis Hayes. He was our student body president. He grew up across the river, Thomas Washington. He and a guy named Gaylord Nelson, who was a senator from Wisconsin, started Earth Day. It started as a environmental teach-in, um, and that's what Gaylord Nelson wanted to, to do. Uh, he hired uh, Dennis, who was uh, actually um, going to Harvard, uh, Kennedy School there, he dropped out, and then went to Washington, D.C., started this, and uh, he said, we'll start a Earth Day an environmental teach-in for the United States. That first year, 50 years ago, we had 2,000 campuses in the United States and 10,000 schools involved, over 20 million people in the United States involved in that's 20% or 10% of our population at that time. Hal Lindsey, the, uh, Harold Lindsey, the um, uh, uh, mayor of New York City stopped Fifth Avenue and they had all these tables up and down. I was on the uh, local committee in at Stanford uh, and, and we had tables all over the campus. And Paul Ehrlich, one of my professors, uh, wrote a book called The Population Bomb, talked about population crises. It was incredible. Uh, 1990, we went international. Now today, 192 countries around the world, billions of people uh, are involved in that. What did it do back in those days? Because environmental acti er, activism was, was started by this Earth Day, but we also had uh, other types of acts of activism against the war in Vietnam, uh, also women's rights, uh, racial rights, etc. All of those things going on at the same time um, it had two major effects on the world. Earth Day did number one, change in behavior. Nobody recycled before that and reuse. And so this came back in. But then also the the changes in policy, starting of the EPA. Uh, environmental, uh, the Clean Air Act, Clean Water Act, Environmental, uh, um, uh, Environmental Species Act, many things like that. And it started a new whole thing of environmental lawyers, environmental writers, environmental uh, this, that, and the other thing, and started teaching environmental sciences. I started teaching in 1971, and I started a new course. It's, I was in Switzerland teaching that for five years called Environmental Sciences. Nobody had heard of it. And what, there were no textbooks out there. You know what I used? I used a book called The Environmental Handbook, 95 cents that we came out for Earth Day. And it had all of the major problems, including climate change in that, at that time. So we had a very special day yesterday, thanks to Dennis Hayes, who still continues today. He's retiring from Bullet Foundation up in Seattle, good friend of mine. And so thank you to Preserve Planet Earth Committee for uh, being involved in that and our club being involved in it. Thank you, Kate. Thank you, Scott, for giving us that whole background of information. I, I knew the uh, it had been one of the older committees that we have, we have had and, and of course been one that a lot of people have been involved with over the years, but I didn't know the full history. And of course, of course you were around since the beginning of it here in Portland. I'm not surprised at all. We're down Stanford and then brought up to Portland. Thanks, no surprise. Okay, 
Next, next up, we have trust board nominations. Yes, there are four spots on the Portland Charitable Trust Board that will open July 1st in 2020. Nominations for these spots are Shelly Kane Stockman, Kim Cash, Jana Cole, Robert Kraft, and Mike Lester. The vote will take place today via email. So watch your inbox for that information and please vote for four out of the five candidates. Voting will close on Friday, May 1st. Looks like it is time for Chair of the Day. I would like to now welcome Rotarian Dan Bramski as today's Chair of the Day. Thank you, Kate. Good afternoon, fellow Rotarians. I hope you're all doing well. It is my sincerest pleasure today to introduce our speaker today, Kami Chaos. Kami has had a love of WordPress since the last century. WordPress, for those of you who are not familiar, is an online publishing and website creation software built with the mission of democratizing publishing for all. WordPress is currently used for about 75 million websites around the world, making it the most popular website creation software of its kind. Kami has also participated in WordCamp Portland since the early 2000s. WordCamp Portland is an annual in-person conference for the WordPress community. Since 2013, Cami has worked at Automatic as a community organizer for the WordPress community and gets to work with WordCamps and their organizers from around the world on a daily basis. In addition, Cami continues to write on an irregular basis at camichaos.com, where she explores concepts from the plight of modern parenting to mental health to marveling at the seemingly mundane. When Cami's not helping people around the world, she lives, works, and parents here in our rainy city and sometimes our sunny city of Portland, Oregon. Um, having worked from home for the last 10 years, Cami has learned how to effectively work from home and lead distant teams and communities. Today, she will share with us her triumphs, her failures and pitfalls, and some wise lessons she's learned along the way. And with that, I'd like to welcome Cami to our meeting. Thank you so much, Dan. Hi everyone. I am super honored to be here today uh, to share with you a little bit uh, of what I've learned over the last decade while working from home. Uh, as Dan said, I'm Cami Chaos. Uh, if you are looking for me on the internet, if you would like to ask me a question or get a hold of me, I'm Cami Chaos pretty much everywhere. Uh, and I would love for you to reach out to me. Generally, before I start a talk like this, I want to introduce myself and let you know a little bit more about me. But Dan did a really good job of sharing my bio. So I feel like you're already uh, in the right place with me to understand how it is I came to understand this working from home thing so well. Uh, so I think we're just going to go ahead and move on to talk about working from home or distributed work. Uh, I'm not just going to talk about working from home for people who are employed and working remotely right now. I feel like I am in a unique position to share some wisdom with y'all about uh, what it's like to reach out to the outside world when you are inside in a singular location. So I'm going to do that. So you're going to hear a lot right now uh, when we're talking about working from home about people being distributed or people being remote. And I just want to like dispel any confusion or any buzzwordiness when we say you're a distributed worker or we're a distributed company or it's a distributed team. We're just talking about working from home. Part of the reason that we moved on from the whole uh, work from home is that technology kind of feels like we created this. Uh, I work for a technology company and that technology company uh, sponsors me to work on a nonprofit program, on an, on an open source program, which just means the software uh, of the program I work on is freely available to everyone in the world and anyone can also help to work on it. And so when technology uh, and technology companies started to kind of take over this whole working from home thing, we made it our own. Uh, we came up with new cultures around it. We came up with blog posts about how to be a work from home person, how to be distributed. We started recording podcasts. We came up with new businesses, teaching people how to be distributed. Uh, and a lot of those are focused around people not working from their office, but working from a co-working space, working from a coffee shop or working from home. And that's kind of why the change in language came about. 
but right now we're just going to talk about plain old working from home because that's where most of us are. Uh, us technology companies did not invent working from home. Working from home started a long, long, long time ago, longer back than I can remember. But my first understanding of working from home really came from my mother. Uh, my mom was a stay-at-home parent to two small children. My dad was off working. I uh, had to travel for work a lot. And not only was she working hard with the two small children, but she needed something to kind of be her own. And she wanted to bring in a little extra money. And so I remember very vividly my mom being a Tupperware salesperson. Uh, she would take the orders, she would throw the parties. I never once remember my mom going into the Tupperware office. Years later, she became an Avon salesperson. Uh, and again, everything was done at home. Even before that, we had people working from home. We've had support crisis center folks working from home, answering phone calls. We do political canvassing from our homes on phone calls, uh, psychic hotlines. I would assume that those all run from home. And people have been taking home their work for, for years other than that, before we had computers with notepads and with documents and files and typewriters. So this whole working from home thing isn't new, but it feels really new to all of us. And part of that is because in addition to having to be at home, we're away from everything else that we normally know. So I'm gonna kind of move in. Let me tell you what I'm gonna tell you. I'm gonna tell you what are some useful tools for us to use in this time when we're all in our own isolated locations. And these can be implemented not just for working from home, but they can also be really useful for communicating with friends and families and colleagues. Uh, and then I'm going to kind of give you a sense about how you can continue to build bonds and healthy relationships with people, even though we're distributed. And then I'm going to give you some practical tips and tell you some mistakes that I've made over the last decade of working from home. So I'm going to start with the pretty boring part, which is tools. Um, some of these are super technically driven. Some of them are really easy. The ones I kind of want to highlight for you are WordPress because it's the project I work on. If you have any need to get your thoughts and feelings out into the world right now, uh, I can't highly enough recommend that you start a blog and share your thoughts with the world. Um, we've got some great social media tools like Twitter and Instagram. And then the one that I really think about the most is Slack. Uh, Slack is a messaging tool. If you're not on Slack, I just kind of describe it as a box where all of your people live and you can write to them in groups or individually. My team works at work. My team, <laughs> my team at Automatic works in Slack. My teams at WordPress work on Slack. Uh, and you can build a singular Slack instance for every project that you're in and invite people into it. I also have Slack for some of my very good friend groups. There are Portland Slack so that you can understand what's going on in the greater Portland communities. And then my own personal favorite Slack, I created a Slack instance and invited my parents, my aunts and uncles, my cousins, and everyone in my family so that we would have one central location where everyone could come together and talk. Uh, email is still a thing. If you're scheduling meetings right now, it can be hard to play the back and forth email game, trying to figure out when works for everyone. So I would recommend an online scheduling app like Calendly that can just allow you to open up a time and let people submit questions, submit requests to talk to you. It's been really useful for me and for my teams. And if anyone has any specific questions about tools later on, I'm happy to answer them. I just didn't wanna give too much time to something that you could easily Google and find on your own. Um, I just wanted to kind of spur thoughts on it. All right, so now we're going to talk about connecting with people during this time of being online and building those relationships. Uh, when you are communicating with folks on the internet, as I'm sure some of you have noticed in the past, if you have done a lot of online communication, or some of you might be noticing now as we move into this very virtual world, you have to communicate with more intent, especially if you're not on a video call. It's hard to read someone's tone. You can't read someone's body language. You can't see the smile or the like wry wink, I can't wink, eh. 
uh, you can't see what people are doing. You can't feel what people are feeling. So when we communicate uh, in writing or only over voice, it's really important that we use our words. Uh, and I know that sounds like something that one might say to a child, use your words, but I think there is some goodness in going back to the basics. Right now, we need to be clearly expressive. We need to tell people how we are doing because people can't guess right now. And we need to find out how the people in our lives are doing. Uh, you might see someone on a daily basis in the office and so you know that they're okay. You might be walking around and see your neighbors and give them a little wave and know that everything is going fine with them because you see them in their daily routine. Right now, in order to build connection to continue this sense of community and continue knowing that the people in our neighborhoods, uh, both virtually and uh, in real life are doing okay, we have to take extra steps to reach out to them. So this is a really great time for you to be texting folks that you know, sending them an email, uh, calling them on FaceTime, and I would even go so far as to say, putting up kind messages of hope and support in your windows so that when people do walk on by, uh, they know that you're doing okay and they know that they can be doing okay too. All right, so this is where we talk about mental health because mental health can be a very important thing to consider when we're talking about working from home. Uh, and I will tell you briefly that I am a person that experiences mental health challenges. I have generalized anxiety disorder. Uh, I also suffer from panic disorder. And that's kind of been something that I've experienced my entire life. That's just my version of reality. It's not something that I've ever been without, but I know that most people don't experience that. What I am seeing right now when I have these conversations with people every day on the computer about where we are in this work from home world is that most people are now experiencing my reality. Uh, most people are starting to understand what that low hum of anxiety all the way up to roller coaster drops feels like. And so, as I said a few moments ago, it's super important to be transparent about what you're feeling and where you are, not in a scary, overwhelming way, not in a using coworkers and family and friends as therapists sort of way, but in a transparency sort of way, in a touchstone check-in, this is where I am, this is where you are. Uh, this allows us to kind of cut through some of that burden and start to focus on other things. We can't ignore what's going on with our hearts and with our minds and then continue to be as productive as we feel we should be. Um, one of the things I've noticed about people who are working from home for the first time right now is that they expected this to be a great surge of productivity for them. They expected that they would wake up in the morning and that they would not drive into an office or take the train into the office or ride their bike into the office. They would just begin to work and that they would have a full day to get everything done. And my gosh, they'll be the most productive they've ever been in their lives. What I'm seeing in practicality is that people are trying to tamp down the feelings they're having about this new reality that we're in and not giving themselves the room to breathe mentally and emotionally, um, and also not setting up a schedule or a, a set of boundaries for themselves and their families that will allow them to be productive. So the first step to productivity in this working from home world is acknowledging your truth and where you are, accepting that where you are is going to be okay and that you're gonna find a way to move forward with it, and then moving forward the best that you can. With that in mind, we're gonna talk about some of the very good things about working from home, about being distributed. For employers that are uh, distributed employers full-time, one of the things that they like is that they're not paying for an, a physical office space. That's not super applicable right now because we're in a huge crisis and everything is still going on and we're hoping to come back to it. But, it is one of the benefits. We're not having to uh, spend money on those resources. We're not having to worry about cleaning and providing coffee and things like that. So that can be looked at as a benefit. Um, 
a lot of folks realize that this is more convenient for their employees, especially for their introverts, because they don't have to go somewhere to do something and they're not losing that time on the commuting. Uh, also, the ability to recruit people in this time, if you're going to continue being a work from home business, uh, really broadens for you because you can recruit the best people for the work that you are doing, no matter where they are in the world. You're not limited to people who can physically come into your office. Oops. All right. Uh, this is where we talk about the commute. My commute to work used to be about 45 minutes. Uh, it was still in Portland, I'm in Southeast. My partner's commute to work when we are not in a lockdown situation ranges from 15 minutes to an hour and a half depending on traffic that day. And he never even leaves the east side. Uh, so while we can consider that there are a lot of problems with working from home, one of the things that I like to focus on, especially right now, is that we get to take a deep breath and we have that extra time in the morning for things like making a great breakfast, spending time with our families. Um, I like to play Animal Crossing or some other video game in the morning just to give myself a little, uh, a little bit of soft entry into the world while my coffee starts to kick in. Uh, this is also a time when we can really start to focus on work-life balance. I know that a lot of people don't believe in the existence of a work-life balance, but working from home gives us a unique opportunity to kind of set that in motion, to structure our days in a way that we can spend time with our partners. If we have children, we can spend time with our children. If we have loud cats and dogs that tend to interrupt everything that we're doing, we can take a break to spend time with that. Um, it's also a great time for you to start looking at some of your other creative endeavors and saying maybe this isn't all about work. When I was working in an office, I would get up, I would go to work, I would come home, and that whole time in between, I was just exhausted. So when I got home, it felt like a chore to make dinner. It felt like a chore to do anything artistic. I'm a writer. I couldn't even write because I was too tired at the end of the evening. When you have the privilege of being able to work from home, it takes some of that exhaustion out. And if you can switch paces effectively, you can be more present for your family. You can be more present for your creative endeavors. You can decide to paint a masterpiece that you never got to paint or write a poem. Um, and I would really encourage you to look at this as an opportunity to seek that balance a little bit more heartily. Uh, inclusivity is one of the most beautiful things for me about working from home. Uh, people who may not have the mobility to get into an office, people like me who may have anxiety issues that makes it more challenging for them to be in a work environment, and also people who don't necessarily fit into the model of what our society says people should look like. So if you're not a straight white man in Portland, you're kind of in an outside circle in a lot of ways. When you are working from home, it doesn't feel so much like you're going into a a place where you aren't welcome, where you don't belong. And it can make it easier for you to focus on getting the work done. And it can make it easier for you to share your own voice and have people amplify it. Okay, so we talked about the good things, uh, which means that there's also obviously going to be some bad things. Um, one of the worst things I hear about distributed workers that I hope all of you will help dispel in the future is that if you work from home, whatever your job is, it's not a real job. Uh, through my decade of being a distributed employee and leader, I have had other parents assume that I would pick their children up from school and take care of them until they got off work because their babysitter canceled because I don't have a real job. I have had neighbors who ask me to take care of their dogs all day because I don't have a real job. I've had people have packages delivered to my house because they wouldn't be home to get them without ever telling me because I don't have a real job. And there's a bunch of other things in between that happens there. For some reason, society tells us if someone is working from a place that's not an office, what they're doing isn't meaningful, their contribution isn't real, that they are 
selling makeup or selling Tupperware or working a psychic call line or making greeting cards. All of those things are actually important in and of themselves, but there are some people who are making real heavy contributions. Uh, while I researched this original talk from last year, I met people who work for the government from home. I work people who work for large banking platforms from home, uh, project managers, community leaders, an executive at a large coffee corporation, um, and so many technology companies that are literally shaping the world we currently live in all have contributors and employees that work from home. But there's still this negative stigma attached to it. My hope right now is that while everyone is stuck working from home and watching people that they know and love work from home, we can kind of we can kind of jump that hurdle and finally move past that. Um, an article I saw last year in the Harvard Business Review cited a 2015 study based in a Chinese travel agency that found when call center employees were shifted from working from home, from working in person to working from home, their productivity uh, increased by an average of 13%. And part of that was apparently a reduction in break time and sick days combined with more comfortable working environments. It's not all something that we can easily overcome just with the power of positive thought though. For some people, the isolation of working from home is real and it is heavy. And there are some extroverts out there that I'm sure are very much feeling this. Even as an introvert right now, I'm feeling a sense of isolation. Um, it can be very challenging for people to not have the socialization that they're used to, to not go and grab coffee with a friend or a colleague, uh, to not sit in the lunchroom and enjoy a chat with other people. And that's a problem that a lot of people who are working from home feel on a regular basis. And so with the whole world doing it right now, it's something that's very concerning to me. So I recommend if you are doing that, if you're working from home, if your families are working from home, uh, get a Zoom call like we're recording this on and sit down and have lunch with your loved ones, have lunch with your colleagues. Uh, last night to celebrate one of my best friend's birthdays, we had a happy hour. These things can still allow us to have that sense of connection, even if we can't physically be co-located together in person. Okay, my biggest hurdle as a person who works from home, is this distributed work or is this disturbed work? Um, I am used to working from home. I've been doing it for 10 years. I have a now 18 year old daughter and I have a partner. My partner works from home now, he didn't before. My daughter finished high school early by taking online courses instead of going to school in person. I have a cat, I have many plants, I have many neighbors, I have a construction site going on next to me, and on any given day, something is going to happen that's going to draw my attention away from what I'm doing and who I'm dealing with, and it can often be very, very difficult to balance that. Um, I recommend giving yourself the grace to bear with it. And I think that the only things that we can really do to deal with the fact that we have disturbed work, sometimes take a pause, deal with the disturbance. If it's a lonely cat or a lonely dog, take it for a walk, play with it a little bit, give it some pets and a snuggle, you could probably use the break too. If it's a child or a partner who needs attention and the attention is warranted, take a break and spend some time with them and then go back refreshed and focused anew. Uh, but also with other humans, it's very important for you to set boundaries. This is the other big one, sloth. One of the ugly truths about working from home that can be very exciting at first, um, but can start to wear on people is sloth. Sloth and gut gluttony, but mostly sloth. Um, and it looks something like this. You wake up in the morning, you pick up your phone. You start to look at things on the phone. Oh, you put the phone down. You roll over further, you grab your computer. You're in bed, you're working on the computer. You're trying to get things done. You realize that you have a call in 10 minutes. You run out into your office, you set up your computer, 
you run a comb through your hair, you put on a clean shirt, but from the bottom down, you're still wearing pajama pants or boxer shorts. And then the rest of the day, you just spend on the couch. You don't stop to take lunch. You don't stop to take a shower. You don't stop to make yourself feel like the human that you are. Um, everyone has experienced this. That first little arc there was probably two years of my work. I would wake up every morning, I would look at work on my phone, something important enough that I couldn't type with my thumbs would come up, so I'd pull up my laptop. I would work on my laptop until I realized I had a call, uh, lather, rinse, repeat, and this would be my every day. And emotionally, it's not a healthy way to work and it's not a way for you to do your best work. Um, so sometimes you just have to install some structure for yourself and not let sloth get the best of you. Uh, so with all of those challenges and those positive things, it's kind of a choose your own adventure palette of how you can make distributed work and working from home work for you. And it's infinitely customizable depending on your life. The thing that I have found helps me the most is uh, having a place for everything, or more importantly, having a place for not things. Uh, lots of folks have an office, and that's fantastic. If you, if you can walk into your office and say, this is where I am working, it is my workspace, you can let that be known to everyone in your family. If I'm in this workspace, this is what I'm doing, everyone leave me alone. If you don't have the luxury of an independent office, I recommend a little on-air light or a cute little light of some kind that you turn on so that if their family sees it, they know, oh, they're working, no bugging them right now. Um, over ear headphones that are visible are also super helpful for that, for concentration. If you see the headphones on, you know I'm in the middle of something. Uh, but for me, what's far more important is being in a place is not being in a place. I work all over my home. I work in my living room. I work in my dining room. I work in my backyard. I work in this little recording area. The one place I never, ever, ever work is my bedroom. My bedroom is my safe bastion away from work so that I can relax and be calm when I'm in there. It's important that you find a place that is not for work so that you know that you have a place that you can go to that's safe for you to unwind. Uh, the second thing that works really well for me is making a habit of things. We talked about the sloth. When I get up in the morning, I try to pretend that I am getting up and I'm going to work. So I'll get up, I'll take a shower, brush my hair, I put on a little makeup for all of you, make a pot of coffee, have some breakfast, read my morning updates, and dive into my day. That habit really helps me to get in a good headspace to make sure that I'm working um, and that I'm productive. And then at the end of the day, make a habit as well there. Make a habit of what you do. Make a habit of taking a lunch. And then make a habit of, at the end of the day of checking off what you're doing, saying goodbye to your coworkers. Just because you're in a virtual world doesn't mean that you shouldn't tell them that you're taken off. Tell them that have a nice evening and that you're gonna go make dinner. Um, and then disconnect from what you're doing. It can be really hard to separate our personal lives from our work lives when we're living every single part of our life in the same physical space. So find a way to make a habit of doing that for yourself. My way is to say goodbye to my coworkers, shut down my computer, dock it in its charging station, and then not touch it for the rest of the light, the rest of the night. The other thing I do is I have no work instances on my phone. I don't have work email. I don't have work websites. I'm not logged into anything for work. My phone is a work free space. All right. You have to keep it separated. Uh, I may have jumped the gun a little bit on that whole, there's nothing on my phone, uh, but it's true. If you can keep work independent from the rest of your life. I have a separate laptop uh, from work than I do for my rest of my life. I have no work on my phone. I have a planting station where no work ever gets done. And my bedroom is a safe space. That's the most important thing for me. Okay. Uh, I just babbled straight at you for about 30 minutes there. Uh, so I really feel like I have a lot of passion for this and that there's a lot more I could tell you. But since I'm not really sure what any of your experiences are with being a work from home individual or being in isolation right now, um, I feel like I could best answer those questions with questions. It was absolutely my delight and pleasure to be here talking with all of you today, even though it's virtual. Uh, and I hope that if you have any 
doubt about working from home, you'll think about some of these wonderful folks. You'll see at least one familiar name and face in there uh, that were kind enough to talk with me as I prepared this talk. All of these individuals have been working from home or working on a distributed project uh, for some period of time, and they have shared with me some of the same feelings of frustration and joy that I shared with you today. And with that, uh, if you have any questions after the fact, when you're viewing this, you can reach out to me at cambrachaos at gmail.com or cammychaos on Twitter or Instagram or Facebook. Um, thank you all so much for joining me. Thank you so much, Cammy. I really appreciate you going through that whole arc of not just your experience, but uh, what you found works for you uh, in in applying it to these past six, eight weeks that we've all been going through too. Mm -hmm. So I know that some of us have questions and I saw Scott raise his hand. So I'm gonna throw it to Scott to ask a question. Okay, great. Cammie, uh, absolutely wonderful talk. I just can't believe you answered a whole bunch of questions for me. Um, and I love your enthusiasm. Um, I have two quick questions. Number one, your last photo uh, slide that you had was the contributor's photo. Yes. Uh, I'm a professor. I'm teaching online. Mm -hmm. And the one thing that I miss uh, is not the face-to-face -face with all of my students. I have 63 people in there. I can't have them all be on the screen. Mm -hmm. uh, I would love to have a photo of all my students, just like you gave at the end, um, that I have down there. And so when Carrie uh, mentioned something, I can look down and look at... Uh, what does she look like? Because I yeah. may run into these students on campus when this whole thing is over and they say, oh, I was in your class. Oh, really? Well, so that's the first one. The second one, I'm intrigued with your WordPress. Okay. What does it do? And, and I, I, I've heard about it. Mm -hmm. um, and so if you tell a little bit about that. Absolutely. So with the first thing, that's super simple. Anytime I'm working with folks on something that we work together, I kind of build a face index of them because I like to see their faces that's too. Right. Um, and so I would just ask your students with, with an assignment to submit a headshot so that you can put a face with a name. Um, and that way you'll have that available to you forever. Uh, WordPress is an open source software. It's a CMS, a content management system that you can either go and download from wordpress.org and set up on a hosting instance to create your own site, or that you can go to wordpress.com and uh, create a site on their site where they'll do all of the backend work for you. And you can set it up as a blog so that you can share information. You can set it up as a portfolio site. Um, it is an incredibly robust software that just allows you to create websites for the internet. And I think we're around 30% of the internet runs off of WordPress right now. Thank you. You are so welcome. Does anybody else have any questions right now for Cammie? Oh, looks like Dan does. Go for it. Dan. So Cammie, most of us at Rotary are, are leaders within our workplaces or owners. And I'm wondering if you have any specific advice about how to, um, to lead during this time, but also balance that with being respectful of where people are at. Yes, absolutely. Uh, I find that right now, every meeting that I have with someone that I am mentoring or leading in the community, is about 70% emotional check-in and then 30% actual work check-in um, because everyone is feeling a lot of feelings right now. And I find a lot of my conversations start with me saying, so how are you? And then my saying, so really, how are you? Because everyone answers that question, oh, I'm fine, oh, I'm good. Um, and so there is a balance between not pushing uh, because we don't want to force anyone to share their personal struggles if they don't want to, um, but also of making it clear that you're not asking um, in a performatory way. You're asking genuinely, I know this is a challenging time, so how are you really? Uh, and sometimes I start that off by acknowledging, just an acknowledgement prior to asking, I know things are really tough right now. Things are crazy around here. Um, I don't go into the specifics of what is challenging in my situation, partly because I feel incredibly privileged and blessed my family is healthy right now, um, but also because I don't want to weigh them down with what I'm feeling. But give enough 
give enough emotion so that they know that they're in a safe space. And sometimes I even call it out by saying, all right, this is the emotional part of our conversation. We're just gonna talk about feelings and messy stuff right now, and then we'll move on to um, our actual agenda in a little bit. Does that answer that question at all? Yeah, definitely, thank you. And I also wanted to apologize. When I uh, introduced you, I said distant instead of distributed. And oh, I, yeah. I'm, I'm just gonna, start using distributed. It sounds great. It sounds like we're more effective and spread out. We're very fancy this way. <laughs> we're very fancy when we're distributed. Yes. Thank you. Welcome. Any Thank other you. questions from the gang all here? So I have one. Shoot. So you talked about boundaries, which I really appreciate you talking about that and boundaries for yourself. And, and it kind of combines, actually plays off of what Dan just asked, which is how do you Hmm, I guess help others set their boundaries, especially especially around time, around um, being online at asking a very you know important question at 10 p.m. and then they're online again at 7 a.m. and you haven't answered the question because you were you know sleeping and not working. Because this is this is a very timely question for me. Uh, before I joined all of you this morning, I was training a new uh, a new member of our team, um, bringing her on. She is doing translation work for the open source project, and when we onboard people onto the team, a lot of folks tend to start with the worky stuff. Um, and I started off by telling her that we're touchy feely hippie kind of team. Uh, and that downtime is important and that self-care is important, but more important than any of that is setting boundaries for ourselves with our teammates and setting boundaries within the community. So one of the ways that you can kind of signal those boundaries is if you are in a Slack instance, uh, make sure that you turn that green light off if you're not at work so that people uh, or any social media or any work platform where there's a online offline indicator, make sure you turn that off. Um, you can also, when you're working with people, if you have a team that you're working with, if you've got clients that you're working with, let them know your work hours. I work with a team internationally. Um, and so we have a little tool on our sidebar on our website that kind of lets people know what time zone we're each in, but also because we're distributed, our hours are very different according to our lifestyles. I have a friend with two small children at work and she works from 5 a.m. until she's done for the day because that way she can get a good chunk of time when the children are still sleeping. I work when I wake up in the morning um, and I stop working after eight to 12 hours depending on the day. Um, and so just kind of make sure that you have that information. But also when you're starting off those relationships, I think setting expectations is every bit as important as setting boundaries. If people have the expectation that you are not a 24 hour service like 7-Eleven, um, even if they don't really respect that, you have set up the expectation that you can refer back to for them. That is perfect. Yeah, that is definitely one of the things I've been seeing seep into this where um, also because people want to be feeling like they're accomplishing stuff. So it seems like there's people have been more flexible with their boundaries. So I've been, I've been trying yes. to say to my clients and, um, and I figured that you would have some experience, especially since you work internationally. With yeah. The one thing I warn you on is there's always that person that wants to be the last person to send out an email late at night so that they can prove to someone, maybe it's to themselves, maybe it's to a boss, um, that they worked harder or later or longer. Um, don't be that person. <laughs> don't be that person. Send it out later. Um, and also, if you are the person who's communicating a thing late at night, I always like to preface it. If I just happen to be working late at night, this doesn't need an answer right away. Um, so that they know that I'm not expecting something from them as well. Basically comes back down to communication and building those good relationships, trusting relationships. Fantastic. Thank you, Cami, so you. very much for doing this with us today and giving us a lot of great information that I think many of our, many people in our membership may not have known about, especially now that the, everyone's been thrust into this kind of lifestyle, work style workforce, all of this, um, as well as all of everybody that maybe isn't working from home, but is at home and they need to communicate and use technology outside. So um, a lot of those tips of the technology up front was very helpful too. So thank you very much. Yay. And if anybody has any questions for Cami, she had her uh, email there, but you can always 
uh, when we post this to Facebook, you can post questions there that we can get to her as well as, um, again, she's easy to find online and you can track her down, I'm sure, or reach out to one of us. We'll find her for you if you have a pertinent question. Okay, moving on now. Uh, well, next week, next week, our keynote speaker is to be determined. So keep an eye on our website and the newsletter to learn about who our speaker will be. I want to thank everybody that showed up today and was able to be a speaker and talk through all the stuff that is going on right now with our Rotary Club. I want to thank our club's membership whenever, wherever that you happen to be watching this meeting. You might be watching with your family. I'm learning that's happening a whole bunch or you're sharing the video with your friends so they can understand actually what is this Rotary thing? What is Rotary and what does Rotary do in fellowship and in service? That reminds me that last Friday, our spokes newsletter, our weekly newsletter, it was chock full of updates. Many things are going on. There are many links to click on. Uh, at the at a minimum, uh, if you hadn't had the time yet to go through that whole newsletter and, and see all the information that's happening, we are starting, we started last week, and really AJ uh, started last week, a 4 p.m. social half hour, I would say, on Thursdays, and we're going to try it again this week. So that's another thing to keep your eye out in your email to see the link that will come through from the office about that social half hour where we will also have, um, it's kind of reflective of our old fireside chats. So it has a Rotarian who will be speaking on a topic that they are an expert in. They'll just speak for 10 minutes and then people can ask some questions and then we're done after half hour. Uh, it's, it's, I like it because it's, it's a benefit of being a Rotarian because we're all executives and leaders in our community here and um, getting to have these conversations with other peers in your industry or in different industries, it's, it's a benefit of being a Rotarian. So I'm really appreciating that AJ has pulled that together. So as always, take care of yourself, take care of yours. Let's continue our fellowship with each other. Let's continue to find service opportunities through our many club committees so that when we say that we are committed to service above self. It is more than just a motto. It is a Rotarian value that we are upholding. Thank you for joining us today. This meeting is now adjourned. <laughs>